And one of the things that I disagreed with Prime Minister Trudeau on, when we were uh, we were developing, you know, we were de developing our own constitution in Canada, and along with it, we developed a charter of rights and freedoms. Now he, he traveled the world, and he was he was in the, in in Asia, and he was in China, and he was behind the Iron Curtain, and he saw how dangerous it was when people's individual freedoms were suspended, and that's true. But we hadn't experienced that in our part of the world. And Britain never did, never to this day, had a Charter of Rights and Freedoms, but we do. Now what does that mean? Well, it's the, it's the primacy of the individual. The individual is number one. So you can virtually take any case today and you can, you can appeal to the Charter on the grounds of your individual rights have been infringed upon and you're probably going to win. Right? So, if I feel that, you know, my mother has suffered for, uh, you know, a year and a half with cancer and I think that I can't bear her suffering any longer and I think that she, and I'll build a case for the fact that she should be put out of her misery and that she should be given a needle and put to sleep. Uh, that's what our society is headed for very quickly. Because that, that is seen as my individual right to decide that, to determine that. I used to say when I was in Cold Harbor, a lot of the RCMP guys who'd come in from other, out of the area would uh, you'd like to drop by the office and we had coffee and I got to know a lot of the guys pretty well. And I used to say to them, you know, when you're going down the number seven highway at 11 o'clock at night, and somebody comes in the other direction, driving a car, and they're impaired. Why should you have to read them their individual rights? Shouldn't you read them the rights of the person coming in the other direction who has three or four children? And whose lives have been put in danger because of that person? But that's where we get with individual rights. Now, if we were going to have a charter of rights, we should have had not only a charter of rights, but not a charter of freedoms, a charter of responsibilities. Because the popes time and time again kept saying every individual right should be balanced against the common good. Now, an individual case, when I was in Spryfield years ago, one of the women came to me and she had a real dilemma in her family. And that in those days, plaid skirts were the things that all the girls wanted to wear. Girls don't wear skirts anymore, right? Right, they should sometimes. But they, they, they were, and this plaid skirt cost something like $40. Well, 35 years ago, $40 was like $150 today or 200. So she kept insisting on her mother that she should have the plaid skirt. There was three in the family along with the mother and dad. So her mother was a very wise woman. And she brought her in, and she called a family meeting. And she laid out before the family exactly the father was a construction worker, and he made good money. But he didn't make this kind of money. And he laid out before the family, uh, she laid out before the family, here's the amount of money that comes into our home each month. Here are the expenses, and she outlined them. After all the expenses are paid, then we have say, let's say $125 left for the month of discretionary spending. There's five of us. That means we each have about $25. Now, she said to her daughter, now, your skirt costs $40. You have to go to some, another member of the family and say to them, I want you to give me a part of your, your, your spending for the month so that I can fulfill my need to have a, to have a plaid skirt. Make sense? Yeah. Would you do it? <coughs> you know? Why would we sacrifice the common good of the family in order to satisfy the individual needs of one member? But that's what we're doing in our society. Now, I want to say to you something. I love this generation of people. I love your generation. 
I love the generation of young people in university. I work at the hospital and I worked there 40 years ago. I love the attitude of the young doctors and nurses today. They're asking good questions, much different than they asked 40 years ago. Because that was a period when we were trying to, trying to, to appreciate and, and, and to discover and to learn to live with the freedoms that we had. When I was a kid, I grew up in a family of nine. I, we weren't, we weren't uh, I was going to say we weren't poor. Yes, we were poor. Everybody in the neighborhood was poor. It was after the war, and everybody was poor. Fortunately, my father could do two or three things. He was an accountant, so along with jobs, he could do all kinds of other jobs and that sort of thing and, and bring in a little bit of money, but there was nine of us. And so when the circus would came to town, my mother would say to us, we'd call us the youngest five or six together, and say, there's nothing that I would love more than to take you to the circus. I'd love for you to go. But the people across the street have two children. We have nine, or at least we had six then, and the other three were working. So we're not able to go. Well, I've got to be honest with you. I understood that clearly. I understood it. And I understood the pain that my mother experienced having to tell us that. But what a wonderful gift. What a wonderful <coughs> gift. Because to this day, I have never gone into debt to buy something that I didn't need. I've been in debt for things I needed, and I had a program to pay for it, but I never borrowed money for something I wanted rather than needed. Right? Wonderful, wonderful lesson. <coughs> a wonderful lesson. I remember once, uh, you know, uh, saying to myself, uh, you know, I'd like to have some of the things that other people have. But I don't think I'd trade them for my brothers and sisters. Right? We might have to use secondhand <laughs> hockey equipment and you'd have to tape your stick and that sort of thing and make it do for half a season. But I don't think I'd trade any of my other members of the family for that. But yet in our society today, what's happening is we are catering first to the individual needs. And one of the really frightening things is that we are, not only because we're catering to individual needs, we're now developing a lifestyle for young people, or we have, I think we're maybe coming out of it, that where we provide all of their needs and it's all in their own bedroom with a computer and a television and all of this sort of thing. And what do you think that brings? A lack of social skills. How do we relate to people? Can't relate to people if we're walking around with a machine all day, right? My nephew, my grandnephew, and I went out to the hockey game one night, and while we're there, he's on his machine. Now, he's a good kid. Plays three or four sports, football, hockey, lacrosse. All good, good kid, I love him a lot. But I said, Cam, uh, you don't like my company, right? Oh, yeah, I do. Yeah, but you prefer that machine, right? In, that's, that's what individual needs, individual fulfillments do to us, drive us inside. Now, the violence we have in our society, we have to see the connection between the bullying in the, in the playground. Hey, we had bullies when I was a kid. Sure. And if you couldn't handle them yourself, somebody else could put them in this place. Oh, yeah. But there were certain rules, certain rules. I never ever saw, for example, when they, did you, anybody watch that extreme boxing? <coughs> Every once in a while, I go in to get the scores and I see this is on. I can't believe for the life of me that this is allowed to be piped into a home. Those people should be charged. Getting a man on the gr ground and pounding his face into the canvas. Or I saw one night when this guy, he got a, he got a, a, a headlock on the guy from behind. And it reminded me very much of what a coyote would do if they were after a deer. Now this, this, this they're predators. So they'd go up on the back of the deer and they'd get the deer by the, the juggler vein, right? And they would just dig into that until the deer collapsed. 
Well, that's virtually what this guy was doing. He had him from behind and he had a headlock 